Right. I am absolutely delighted to welcome this evening Mr. Mark Westcott. Um, he's joining us as a consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Moorfields Eye Hospital and also the director of the glaucoma service at the Royal London Hospital. Um, he's here to talk all about glaucoma and cataract, something we get asked an awful lot of questions about. So I'm not going to eat into his time any further. I'm going to hand over to the person who you really want to hear from. Thank you ever so much, Mark. Okay, thank you, uh, Robin. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, welcome, everybody. Chilly evening. Hope everyone's wrapped up at home. Um, tonight's talk is about cataract and glaucoma. Um, it's a lot to cover. Um, I am just trying to... Here we are. Um, so this is what I hope to cover uh, during the talk, a little bit about what the cataract is, a little bit about symptoms, a little bit how we treat it. The important thing I think people want to hear tonight is what's its relevant to glaucoma, um, how it influences decision-making, um, what cataract does to pressure in glaucoma, if you have a cataract operation. Most of the audience, I suspect, will have open-angle glaucoma, but there will be some in the audience who have narrow-angle glaucoma. Cataract treatment is a very important part of that, and um, that's what I hope to cover. So um, just a quick uh, summary of what a cataract is. Uh, I'm sure most, most of you know this, but this is a clouding of the natural lens. We have the natural lens just behind the iris, behind the pupil. With age, this clouds and this tends to cause symptoms. Um, we have a remarkably effective operation called phaco emulsification. And here is a, a probe. It's an ultrasonic probe that liquidizes the cataract and we replace it with a, a plastic lens or an acrylic lens. This surgery takes about half an hour, um, about 20 minutes, half an hour, usually done under local anesthesia. It's one of the most effective interventions in medicine um, it, with, with an extremely high success rate. So um, just to summarize perhaps some cataract symptoms, um, what does a cataract do if you have a clinically significant cataract? Well, it causes blurry, blurring of vision, um, it, it dulls the vision, it can cause ghosting or shadowing in the vision. Um, a, another common symptom is glare, which can be quite problematic when you're driving, particularly low sun, you get this sort of scatter and dazzle. Sometimes in more advanced cataract, it can form a sort of dulling of colors, loss of the, of the blue spectrum, it makes the colors kind of lose definition. And, and the final thing is not, not so commonly known is it causes a rather unstable glasses prescription. So if you go and see the optician and you get a new pair of glasses and after a few months they don't seem to work and you get new glasses again and the same thing happens, that's a pretty good symptom of, of cataract progression. It, it basically means that it's very difficult for the optometrist to get an accurate prescription. Um, how common is cataract? So this is world health data. Um, so this is a sort of global perspective because I think we should think global, but you can see um, on the left hand that through life, really with every 10 years of aging, the, the kind of prevalence or the number of patients affected with cataract just goes steadily up and up and up. That is a pretty straight, straight line. So in our 60s, a sort of smaller percentage of cataract and each decade it goes up and up and up. The, the green um, sort of lower ones are those with kind of blinding cataract. If that, that, that would be much, much lower in, in, in the developed world, but is a, a major global um, health problem. On the right is, is, is similar data for glaucoma. And, and you can see that goes up. Obviously, glaucoma is less common than cataract, um, but uh, glaucoma actually goes up with age and actually even more steeply up with age. Um, some, some data suggests it actually goes up exponentially. So if we get into our 80s and 90s, maybe 10, 15% of us will get glaucoma. So it's a very strongly linked with aging. So if you, if you look at these two curves, any glaucoma specialist, any glaucoma department, is gonna see a lot of patients, obviously with cataract. If you run a glaucoma service, you'll see a lot of patients both with cataract and glaucoma, hence the topic of this talk. A uh, quick definition of glaucoma. Um, this is a kind of working definition. It's not um, completely exclusive, but effectively it's, it's a very characteristic uh, disease of optic nerve damage. 
we begin to understand now that the vast majority of glaucoma has an extremely strong genetic component. Pretty well every month, a new glaucoma gene is identified. It's not a really influencing our clinical practice yet, but we, we know that this is an extraordinarily strong genetic component. In terms of intraocular pressure, the way I like to think of it is that intraocular pressure is a sort of risk factor. So the higher the intraocular pressure, it, it, it's, it's, it kind of exponentially increases the risk of getting glaucoma. But that does mean that you can have glaucoma with a very low um, intraocular pressure. We call that normal tension glaucoma. It also means you have quite high intraocular pressure and never get glaucoma. That's absolutely not a one-to-one. -one. And these are other risk factors that we know about. Ethnic risk factors, so African patients, Afro-Caribbean patients, we know have an increased risk of open angle glaucoma. The family history I've alluded to that really um, relates to, to genetics. Advancing age, I've shown you a slide to show that it glaucoma really increases remarkably with age. And there's uh, some new research that show um, diabetic patients have an increased risk of uh, glaucoma. And also, if you, <laughs> excuse me, if you have hypertension, there are some eye related risks. I don't want to get too bogged down, but in, in the reality of this lecture, uh, an additional interesting risk factor is if you have a very high myopic prescription. And that's really above about minus six. So extremely short sighted patients are also at risk of glaucoma. This is just a quick color photograph of, of the sort of changes we see. On the left is a nice healthy optic nerve. I've told you that the optic nerve is the, is the key structure affected by glaucoma. These are the blood vessels on the retina. We look at the neuroretinal rim and we can image it. We can take wonderful pictures of it. But effectively on, on the left is a healthy optic disc and on the right is a glaucoma optic disc. We can see this thinning of the neuroretinal rim. This, this nerve tissue looks all weedy, it looks pale, and we call this optic disc cupping. And this was uh, first identified over about 120 years ago. This is a very well-established um, pathological process. We often um, uh, you know, assess the visual field, which is a, a critical part of our glaucoma assessment. Many of you will be used to doing visual fields. So here is a, a glaucoma optic disc, there's thinning of the inferior neuroretinal rim, and this has left to some damage of the visual field. So this is a, a visual field defect that's cut right across fixation. It's cut across the horizon. The superior field of vision has been lost. It should be this kind of light speckle, and now it's black. That means the patient's not seeing on the superior field of vision. And we use that to assess monitoring. How do we treat glaucoma? Well, the only Valid treatment is lowering intraocular pressure. And we have good data that that does work. So um, that is our key target. There may be some interest in neuroprotection and genetic treatments, but there's nothing we can really prescribe right now that has a good evidence base other than lowering intraocular pressure. So if we want to lower intraocular pressure, these are the typical ways that we do it. We, we can use drops. Many of you with glaucoma will be on drops. We can use um, a laser called selective laser trabecular plasty. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you've had a lecture on that already. This is a very commonly performed treatment modality, becoming more increasingly common. We can do surgery. In terms of the surgery we can type, type to uh, surgeries we can do, I'm going to split it up into three. One is the sort of classic surgery that's been around 40, 50 years. One would be filtration surgery, sometimes known as trabeculectomy or tube surgery. This is invasive surgery. And then the others, um, over the last 10, 15 years, we've had the um, development of some micro stents. This is called minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, sometimes shortened to MIGS. I don't know why it's named after a Soviet jet, but that's what we call it. And the other one is called cataract surgery. Okay, so these are all types of surgery we can do to lower intraocular pressure. So just to, uh, spend a, a moment or two talking about drops. What's the uh, relevance of drops and cataract? We do know that patients who are on long-term glaucoma drops have um, a number of side effects. Um, some of this is related to preservatives, red eye, dryness, watering eye, lid redness, discoloration. So some of these are 
related to the side effects of the agents. Quite a lot of these are related to the use of preservatives. So I'm sure we would generally hope of, that there is a much greater move towards preservative-free drops. Um, the other interesting thing is, and we don't have great data on this, but if you're on long-term glaucoma drops, there does seem to be an increased risk of getting cataract. We don't quite know why that is, but it may well be that glaucoma drops cause very low-grade chronic inflammation, which um, affects the lens and speeds up cataract formation. We don't have great data, but we do know that that does occur. Let's talk a little bit about the, the classical types of glaucoma surgery. So these are very traditional operations. This is um, traditional invasive surgery, the trabeculectomy and the tube operation. Um, some of you may be familiar with these. These are kind of more invasive um, operations. They, they do work. They've been around for decades and we've spent decades refining them, making them safer. They, they certainly can be effective. They have a slightly higher risk of, of side effects. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on those, but there are risks with these types of um, surgeries and they have a sort of longer recovery. But they are effective in pressure lowering. This is a top picture of a, of a patient who's had a trabeculectomy. We can see this is a drainage bleb. So we've got aqueous coming out of the, um, uh, through a little hole in the sclera, forming this kind of painless blister on the top of the eyeball. And this is a patient who's had a tube insert is inserted. So if you look carefully, you'll see this plastic tube um, inserting into the anterior chamber and it's connected to a kind of plastic plate, which is underneath the membranes on the top of the eye. So these are traditional uh, glaucoma surgeries, filtration surgery and tube surgery. And then more recently over the next, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've had the development of minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. And these are micro stents or, or mini stents and I'll spend quite a lot of time talking about the, the various stents that we can use. <clears throat> so one of the issues is that um, if you've had glaucoma surgery um, and you develop cataract, um, after cataract surgery, there's a, a slightly higher risk of that glaucoma surgery failing. And for example, if you have a trabeculectomy operation and you have to undergo a cataract operation, about 25% of the trabeculectomies will fail after that surgery. <clears throat> and this is an example. This is a patient who's had trabeculectomy surgery in both eyes. This is the right eye where we see a nice kind of quiet looking trabeculectomy bleb, which is functioning well. And in the left eye, he had trabeculectomy surgery and then subsequently underwent cataract surgery. And we can see it all looks rather inflamed. There's some angry looking blood vessels and there's some scarring. So this bled is in trouble, this is not working well. <clears throat> Why does it happen? We don't fully understand, but we know that cataract surgery does cause some low-grade inflammation. and inflammatory mediators and agents percolate underneath the bleb and cause scarring. And for that reason, we sometimes use anti-metabolite um, injections around the time of surgery, as in uh, the cataract surgery, to try to prevent this process. But it does, it is a problem. There is uh, some evidence that if you've had a tube operation, which is the other sort of classical type of surgery, that's more likely to work after cataract surgery. So that might in, um, influence the decision making. If you've got a patient who has quite a bit of cataract and is and, and a very high pressure, you might decide to put a tube uh, implant in first because that is more likely to survive cataract surgery. But again, we don't have great data on that. So what about cataract surgery um, in, in, in glaucoma? What, what does it do? So these are sort of a patient with glaucoma who perhaps hasn't had a trabeculectomy. What's the effect of a cataract operation on its own? Well, cataract surgery is very effective for, for bringing eye pressure down. Um, so this is a, a patient um, undergoes a cataract operation and typically a few months down the line, you'd often find that the pressures come down by four or five millimeters of mercury, which is quite a useful reduction. And um, this is what's called a meta-analysis. So these are 20 studies that have looked at that and um, there are various numbers of patients. And um, it's kind of looked at the, the overall effect in terms of pressure lowering. So if, um, if we move to this little plot here, 
if the cataract surgery had achieved nothing, all the all these data plots would lie on the, on the zero line. There'd be no difference between the pre-surgery and the post-surgery. But you can see they all lie on the right, which means that the post-operative pressure is lower than the pre-operative pressure. Some of the studies, it varies a bit. Sometimes it's a bit higher, sometimes a bit lower. But you can do um, a, statist a statistical analysis and you can sort of give a summary of all of these according to a certain weighting measures. And th this study came up with a, a, a lowering of about eight millimeters of mercury. That's a little bit high to me, but you can achieve a pressure reduction just by simple cataract surgery on its own. Um, why does it happen? Don't fully know, but um, op cataract surgery opens up the drainage structure in the eye, so there may be a mechanical effect. Also leads to a bit of low-grade inflammation, which actually could be good for the drainage structure because some inflammatory cells might go in and sort of clean it up. So this is what we call low-grade inflammation leading to angle remodeling. But at, at the end of the day, Cataract surgery on its own is quite a useful intervention for glaucoma in terms of bringing pressure down. So we've talked a bit about cataract surgery on its own. Well, what if we combine cataract surgery with a little stent? And this is sometimes called FACO plus. So you do a cataract operation. And as you're operating at the, at the same time, you can put a little mini stent in. You probably wouldn't do a traditional combined kind of big stent. So you might, these days we tend not to do cataract surgery combined with trabeculectomy or cataract surgery combined with major glaucoma tube surgery. But we certainly like to do cataract surgery combined with mini stents. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these. So these are sometimes called mixed devices, minimally invasive glaucoma devices. And there are an awful lot on the market. It's a huge business. Um, I mean, we've got, probably about 10 different stents on the market. I'm gonna talk about three or four of them. Typically they're used at the same time as the cataract surgery. And the advantage is that they're fairly quick to insert and they lead to a faster recovery. So they don't add much to the um, surgery time. There's very rapid rehabilitation. So it's not like the traditional glaucoma surgeries, which um, you know tend to have quite a slow prolonged recovery. So they're very e generally quite easy to, to use. So these are, this is just a slide of some of them and it, it may well be out of date as, as of today, but we can split the type of stents into three really. We, we can have on the left-hand side, so these are sort of mini tube stents that take aqueous fluid through a channel in, in the kind of cornea or sclera to form a, a little mini pleb and the, the most commonly uh, type of, of this device is what's called the Prezel Flow. Um, there are some other types that I won't talk about, but this one is called the Prezel Flow. And then we can move to what suprachoroidal outflow. So this is a peculiar pathway that is just underneath the white coating of the eye, which is called the sclera and the uvea. So there's a, a little passage of fluid between the sclera and the uvea for aqueous to percolate through. It's called the uveoscleral pathway of the suprachoroidal space. And there's a stent called the miniject, which we insert into this um, channel here. And then more commonly are the little mini stents that we put into the Schlem's canal, which is the trabecular meshwork. There's a whole host of these, um, but for the point of view of, of, of time, I'm gonna largely talk about what's called the eye stent and the hydra. So these are probably the two most commonly performed um, stents that we, we insert into the trabecular meshwork. So these are the um, little mini stents that I'm going to um, talk about briefly. So the eye stent uh, inject, I would say it's probably the most popular device. It's been around the longest. It has quite a lot of data. I use it myself. Um, this is um, a microscopic stent made out of titanium. This is obviously massively magnified, but it's only 0.36 of a millimeter. So it looks like a, a tiny, tiny sort of speck of dust almost. And this is a one euro coin and it's about as big as that one on a one euro coin. So it is a tiny, tiny little stent. In fact, there's two that are injected, you have a little injection device and you implant these little, they're almost like collar studs into the trabecular meshwork. Maybe takes about five, 10 minutes, typically done at the end of the cataract operation. Do the cataract surgery, put the lens in the eye, 
and inject these little mini stents. And um, it does work. So this is this is one set of data. There's a lot of data out there in the literature, but I'll just show you this. Um, this is a, a reasonably well designed study uh, published a few years ago. So this is a graph of of, of the pressure. So what this study did was it, it took patients and it took the average pressure before surgery and it removed all the drops that the patients were on just to see what the real pressure off drops was. So they had a pressure of about 25 and then they did the surgery and we've got month three, month six, 12 month. And you can see you've got quite a dramatic reduction from about um, 25 down to 13 thereabouts. Some of these patients would have had maybe one glaucoma drop, and then they removed the glaucoma drops to see what the real pressure off drops was. So, and then and they and they did that every year. So every every year, um, they removed the drops just to see what the real pressure was like, just to get a feel for what the it's called a washout period. So, um, the, the the two ways of looking at this is that the pressure on drops went from nineteen to thirteen, which is about nineteen down to thirteen on drops, or if you want to look at another way, it went from 25 down to 16, which is more or less the same sort of um, drop, but that's having removed the drops. It, the other thing is that um, if you look at the number of drops the patients were on pre-surgery um, and post, um, you, you could certainly manage to reduce their drops by about one. So most of these patients could at least, if, if you're on two drops before surgery, you can remove one drop after surgery. So we get a, a pressure reduction and we can also remove some of these drops, which is an important quality of life issue. Moving on to the hydrus, this is another fairly commonly performed stent. This is a little bit bigger. It's resting on someone's finger. It's like a little kind of wire pipe. It's about five or six millimeters in length. And this is injected into Schlen's canal, which is a small collector drainage canal. You've got this little uh, kind of insertion device that's, that's put through an incision in the cornea and you, un you kind of wind this into the um, drainage channel. Again, the, there's one study that was sort of quite a, well, a number of studies, but the best one was, was, was a, a randomized control study looking at cataract versus hydrus. Um, by about three years, the pressures were fairly similar, but the key thing is that the patients who'd had the stent more likely to um, have been able to give up their glaucoma drops. So you, you don't get a dramatic reduction, but you do allow patients to get off their glaucoma drops. And I've already said that glaucoma drops can cause you know, side effects and, and, that, and it's a quality of life issue. Here's uh, another device. This is called the Miniject. This is a fairly new device that goes into the suprachoroidal space as a sort of biodegradable um, sort of polymer that, that has lots of pores in it and is injected again through a sort of injection device. You, you put a prism on the eye and, and you inject it into the suprachoroidal space. There's the device. You hold that in the hand. The surgeon, you can see, will we'll inject this into the suprachoroidal space. And the idea is that fluid passes through all these little channels and then um, kind of percolates into this space called the suprachoroidal space. And it does seem to work. Same sort of thing. This is a pre-surgery group of a pressure of about 23, 24. After surgery at about two years, you get a pressure of about 13 and it rises a little bit over time. But you can see there's still quite a useful reduction from 23 down to 15. And um, again, uh, just under half the patients were able to kind of stop all their glaucoma drops, which is another benefit. So you're probably getting a theme that all of these devices lead to some pressure layering, which is actually pretty similar, dependent, irrespective of, of the device you use. And about 40% will be able to stop drops. So you get a useful um, uh, kind of pressure layering and, and uh, you know, quite a lot of patients will be able to stop their drops. Final stent I'm gonna talk about was what's called the pressure flow. This is a little bit different that you have to actually open up the conjunctiva. There's the little plastic stent. It's a plastic stent that's inserted into the front chamber of the eye. And then you close that up and it drains fluid. So you, you form a sort of trabeculectomy bleb, slightly different. Um, so fluid goes from the front chamber into this bleb underneath the conjunctiva. 
And um, again, how does it compare to trabeculectomy? Well, it's much faster. There's fewer visits. The recovery is faster. Probably lower risk. Carries it's less invasive. What are the downsides? Well, if you compare this against the standard trabeculectomy, the the success rates are lower. If if you have a a reasonable definition of success, you get of maybe say twenty percent in terms of pressure lowering. The um, Present flow achieved a success of about 50% versus about 72%. So you have to accept that there is um, a lower success rate. And um, the patients are a bit more likely to need to stay on glaucoma drops. So there is a downside. The upside is quicker surgery. Downside is less pressure lowering effect compared to trabeculectomy. Okay, so we've covered um, cataract surgery on its own. We've covered cataract surgery with lots of mini stents. Most of that's been talking about what's called open angle, which is the vast majority of the glaucoma we see in the UK. But there's still an important um, glaucoma disease called narrow angle glaucoma, which globally is a big um, health problem. Um, and that's called narrow angle glaucoma. So uh, angle closure glaucoma is fairly uncommon. It's about 5% of the glaucoma in the UK, so maybe one in 20, one in 30 patients. It varies a little bit in terms of our populations. I, I um, uh, have an NHS practice around the Whitechapel, which is a predominantly Asian population, so I have quite high rates of angle closure. But if you go to Asia and Greenland, it's the commonest type of glaucoma. So this is an Inuit um, individual. Um, he has a higher risk of angle closure glaucoma. So um, it's a major cause of, of worldwide glaucoma, and it's the commonest glaucoma in Asia. And because it's um, under-recognized, um, it's often in developing world countries, it actually causes half of the glaucoma blindness, not, not in the UK, but worldwide. So it's an important health, um, public health uh, problem. So this gives us a world map of the types of glaucoma. So the red, box is, is narrow angle and, and, and the number in the white in the black box is open angle. So if we look at the UK or Europe, about the, the prevalence of open angle glaucoma is about 2% and the prevalence of angle closure is 0.1%. So much, much rarer in Western European populations. But if we go to Greenland, it's the other way around, about 5% of, of, of um, Greenlandic populations, Inuit, have angle closure and the open angle glaucoma is less common. Again, if we look at China or Asia, um, angle closure is the more common type of um, glaucoma that we see. USA, similar to, to Europe, um, open angle, much more common. So just to get a quick understanding of what angle closure glaucoma is. On the left is a normal eye. We've done a sort of slice through the eye. The ciliary body secretes some aqueous fluid, which actually has to pass through the pupil and get to the drainage angle. So this little circulation through the pupil. In angle closure, for various anatomic reasons, usually because you've got a thicker lens and a, and a narrow anterior chamber, the, the, the um, iris touches the lens, or you get what's called pupil block, and the fluid can't pass through the pupil, builds up pressure behind the iris, and blocks off the drainage structure. It kind of distorts the shape of the iris and um, it flattens off and blocks the outflow channel. So we call that narrowing of the angle. How do we treat it? Well, the typical treatment um, used to be, or is, a laser iridotomy. So we've got two types of treatment. One is you can make a hole in the iris with a laser. And um, so this is a patient with this pupil block um, angle closure, you make a hole in the iris and then the fluid can get through that little hole and can get into the drainage angle. So that's a very traditional type of laser treatment called a laser iridotomy. And the alternative is actually to do cataract surgery because cataract surgery, you replace the human lens, which is quite fat, quite thick, with a much thinner plastic lens and you can open up this drainage structure. So there's two types of therapies, laser iridotomy, or cataract surgery. And um, a few years ago, um, about eight years ago, there was a landmark 
study that looked at these two types of treatments in terms of what was the better um, treatment. And this is a randomized control multicenter trial. It's one of the great glaucoma studies done in the last 20 years to see which was the better treatment. Um, cataract surgery, which is sometimes called early lens extraction or laser iridotomy. So there's uh, about 420 patients over 30 sites, including the UK. So these patients had angle closure. Some of them had just high pressures. Others had high pressures with nerve damage, which is called primary angle glaucoma. The others would have just had primary angle closure, but have been the high risk of getting glaucoma. And they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to laser iridotomy, or effectively cataract surgery. We call that clear lens extraction because they didn't have much cataract most likely but it's exactly the same surgery. So effectively for all intents and purposes, we can call that cataract surgery. And these are the results. So these are um, some of the results. If we look at the eye pressure, this is the cataract surgery group and these were the pressures down the line. So at 36 months, we, I mean, we started with a pressure of 30. By definition, you had to have that pressure again to the study. And this group had cataract surgery 36 months, that pressure's come, come down beautifully. Now, well in the normal range, pressure about 16, thereabouts. The laser group, um, the pressures were consistently a little bit higher after the laser. So the laser didn't seem to get the pressures down as much as cataract surgery. We've got a pressure about 18 compared to about 16, and that was significant. So cataract surgery is better at getting the pressure down. And then if you look at the number of drops in terms of glaucoma drops that these patients needed, again, a very big difference. So the ones that had cataract surgery, um, the typical number of drops was, was about 0.4. So less than one drop per patient. If you look at the patients who just had laser, most of them were still on glaucoma drops. So again, a big difference between the drips. So if you had the cataract surgery, there was a good chance you could get off the drops. And this was highly significant. The other one that the patients who had the cataract surgery, they needed very few additional surgeries. They were, you know, a, a, fair, a fair rate of them were completely cured. But if you looked at the ones that had laser, quite a lot of them needed further surgeries, including cataract surgery to fix the problem. So you're probably getting the message now, cataract surgery was a very effective intervention for angle closure glaucoma. And if you looked at the quality of life after the patients, you can ask them a sort of questionnaire, pre and post surgery, the patients who were in the cataract surgery group had actually quite a significant improved quality of life. And the reason is that if you have narrow angle closure glaucoma, you often have a very high hypermetropic glasses prescription and cataract surgery could get rid of that and that actually improves quality of life. The other conclusion was, well, people said, well, cataract surgery is still an intervention. Is it risky when in modern hands, cataract surgery was very safe and they had an extremely low rate of complications. Mm -hmm. So this tells us that cataract surgery is a very important intervention in angle closure. Okay. So that uh, summarizes my talk. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for listening. And I think the idea now is that we're gonna take a few questions on the chat lines. Hello. Wonderful. Well, I certainly learned a lot. So a huge thank you for that. As I suspected, the questions are flowing in. Um, I would just give a reminder to people, as always, with our Q&A, please do try and keep them on topic. I will share helpline details with you if you've got questions that aren't around glaucoma um, and cataracts. And also just a reminder, obviously, we don't have anybody's medical notes, so they need to be general questions rather than very specific ones necessarily to you. But without further ado, there are a lot that have come in. One person has asked, um, I have both cataract and glaucoma, which is likely to be causing the blurred vision that I'm experiencing? Well, that's a good question. Um, we need to know more about the blurring. I mean, I can't do a consult now, but um, cataract surgery tends to cause um, refractive errors, so problems with getting the glasses right. A degradation of acuity. So if you're, if you're having problems reading down the bottom of the chart, um, it tends to cause glare and scatter. Glaucoma typically doesn't do that. It can do, but um, 
glaucoma can cause more problems with the field of vision, steps and stairs, those sorts of things. So um, you, you can't tell simply from the, the, the phrase blurring of vision. It depends a little bit more precisely what, what the uh, problem is. Um, and only your ophthalmologist can answer that. And you'd actually have to look at the visual field as well. So um, there are subtle differences in terms of the symptoms that people get if you have cataract compared to glaucoma. And a lot of glaucoma, in fact, is asymptomatic. I'm not saying yours is necessarily, but most patients, thankfully, if glaucoma is caught early, are fairly unaware of, of their glaucoma. You can have a small visual field defect and be completely unaware of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, somebody has said they've got advanced glaucoma. They actually have normal tension glaucoma. They've already had a trabeculectomy in both eyes, but have now developed cataracts. They've successfully got pressures down very low. Uh, in fact, it's sitting about three at the moment. Um, does very low pressure present any difficulties in cataract surgery? I would say generally not these days with modern um, FACO machines, um, as long as the pressure is not, I mean, pressure three is quite low. Um, I mean, that's verging on, on, on hypotony. Um, and I'm not going to go into whether that's a corrected, if you've got very thin cornea, the real pressure may be higher than that. Um, so that's, I think there's a difference between having a low end of pressure and having an extremely low, abnormally low pressure. There's a subtle difference between those two. I can't tell. The, the difference but um generally these days probably doesn't present any great difficulties fabulous thank you um we've had another question asking during surgery for cataract and mix is there a significant rise in iop and if so can this period of surgery cause additional damage to the optic nerve i would say generally not um i mean there are always rare risks but the vast majority of cases you don't get a significant rise um with with modern FACO machines you can control the pressure and MIGs generally don't put the pressure acutely up uh in in the eye so it's 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 always possible but it's pretty uncommon fabulous um somebody has said you've mentioned that there's a 20 to 30 percent risk of trabeculectomy failing after cataract surgery does failure generally happen soon after the cataract op or is it a risk kind of up to years later? Yes, I mean, that's quite a good question. I think there's probably a, a cumulative risk that's greatest in the first six months after surgery. I would say we don't have great data on it. Um, but, but if you get through you know, the first six to nine months and it's still working, it's probably going to be OK. But I would say that the, 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 the risk is highest in the first, you know, six to nine months after a cataract operation. So it's not that you have the cataract surgery, it works and suddenly stops working years down the line. That's generally the, the initial post-operative period. That's brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, we've got questions coming in from Facebook as well as emailed ones, as well as the ones on the chat. So um, does... Uh, you mentioned that kind of adding the MIGS procedure doesn't particularly increase um, the pressure within the eye, but does cataract surgery alone increase? Whilst uh, they're doing the surgery, do they increase the, the pressure? With with modern machines, it, it's, it's very rare. Um, I mean, I think possibly people are worried about a sudden catastrophic loss of vision if they've got bad glaucoma. And this is something that, that has been a concern to ophthalmologists for, for many years. We're talking about patients with extremely frail, brittle optic nerves with advanced glaucoma undergoing cataract surgery. And there was always concern that something around the time of surgery or in the hours afterwards that a pressure spike would damage severely and take away residual vision. Um, Professor Vizwanathan has presented some data where they did a national survey looking for it and I think they collected 10 cases over two years. So, you know, if you do the maths, it's an extraordinarily rare risk. I mean, you can say never say never, but the answer is that in the vast majority of cases, cataract surgery does not cause a pressure spike with modern, modern cataract surgery, with modern machines and modern instrumentation and modern techniques. So 
it's not generally a problem. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, somebody's asked, when is it not recommended to have cataract surgery? Well, um, OK, I think the from the patient's perspective, um, it's not recommended to have cataract surgery. I suppose if you if you as long as you don't have angle closure, so if you have open angles and you're completely asymptomatic, it's probably not recommended to have cataract surgery because you might well be disappointed. So if, if you know, your vision is good, you have no glare, you have no halos, your glasses prescriptions been stable, you might undergo cataract surgery, but you're not gonna get much of a wow factor. I mean, in my preference, it's much better to operate on a patient with a symptom who's struggling with nighttime driving or, you know, likes to watch the football and can't see the the numbers on the players' backs, or they've got some definable degradation in vision that he can, he or she can put down to cataract. So, operating on a completely asymptomatic patient is probably not a good idea. Um, when is it not advisable? That's a tricky one, I suppose. If, if there's a staggeringly, you know, unusual eye with extreme myopia. Um, multiple retinal detachment surgeries you know that just is a case of balancing the pros and cons that just means that that cataract surgery is going to be more complicated and more risky i hope that's answered it to some degree yeah absolutely now there are some bits in here that may need a little bit of explanation so i i hope uh that between us we can muddle through somebody has said i've had a trabeculectomy and cataract surgery and now have Capsular distension Stitch. syndrome and okay. I'm having YAG laser treatment. How successful can this be? First of all, can you shed some light for those who may not be aware of capsular distension syndrome as to kind of yeah, you, what usually <laughs> we, we use sticky fluids to um move tissues around inside the eye, and um usually some of that fluid can can be kind of retained inside the eye behind the plastic lens implant and it sort of moves the implant and pushes the bag back and it can can mess up the 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 the, the, uh, the glasses prescription or the refraction after surgery that's the usual cause without seeing the case i can't be sure but but usually uh, a, a laser capsulotomy is a is a fairly successful um, treatment for that because you do a laser and then it releases this viscous fluid and just and it just gets absorbed so it's usually a fairly successful treatment wonderful thank you um so we've uh, uh, got a question in saying could you please give advice about the possible future need for removal of cataract following presaflow implants and future vitrectomy for pronounced erm so there's quite a few different different things going on here and obviously if it needs um uh, I mean, with the advice about cataract surgery with, following a presaflow, uh, my only advice would be it would be quite a high risk of failure after the cataract surgery. So the surgical team, I would imagine, would be putting some anti-scarring medicine um, around the time of surgery to keep it working. Uh, I don't think I'd really comment on 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 the, on the vitrectomy for, for ERM. That's a vitro-retinal surgical uh, discussion, and, and that depends on the specifics of the case, I think. I've got something, can you have successful cataract surgery after trabeculatum? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the vast majority of cataract surgery will go extremely well after trabeculectomy surgery. There is this slightly increased risk of failure after trabeculectomy, after um, cataract surgery following trabeculectomy. We talked a little bit how we can address that. Absolutely, fabulous. Do some patients undergo both cataract surgery and peripheral iridectomy? Um, well, the answer is no, not at the same time. Um, if it's an acute angle closure, a glaucoma, you may elect to do a laser iridotomy and subsequently need cataract surgery. Um, if it's more chronic angle closure, you may go straight to cataract surgery. So what I can say now is that we're doing far fewer laser iridotomies. And if you're doing cataract surgery on its, uh, on its own, you would never need to do an iridotomy at the same time, more or less. Comes down. 
exceptions to the rule. But, but we are doing fewer laser iridotomies on the basis of that study. Fabulous. Now, I, I, I don't know how likely this is, but somebody's saying I've had a trabeculectomy in the right eye and have a side pass dent in the left. They've already had um, cataract in surgery okay, in both fine. eyes. Yeah, yeah. But interested to hear about possible failure of glaucoma interventions after cataract surgery, like when can it happen? Is is it likely that a side pass would have been put in independently of cataract and then a cataract develop? Or is that kind of not likely? Uh, a cataract can develop after a side pass um, stent. Um, all of these mixed procedures probably increase cataract formation. But as I said, it happens anyway, and it's increased in glaucoma patients, perhaps on drop. So it's hard to be specifics on that, really. Um, but but it's feasible that um, the MIGS procedure could have accelerated the cataract. Is Do do we know yet whether MIGS procedures are likely to kind of subsequently fail in the same way that trabs and tubes may as a result of cataract surgery, or do it's we good, just not know that yet? It's a good question. We don't really know that that data. I mean, uh, I'm not aware there may be one or two studies. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it depends a little bit on on, on the MIGS procedure, but, but we don't really know quite Problem with the mixed procedures, they're a rather varied bunch of things. So there's all stents that go in, and there's some the pressure flow is a is a is a traditional kind of uh, tube that goes into the subcontractile space that might be more at risk. An eye stent possibly less affected, but we don't we don't really know. It's a good question, but we don't know. Okay. Fabulous. Um, please, could you comment on astigmatism and how this would affect any cataract surgery alongside having normal tension glaucoma? Is astigmatism going to kind of play a part in that surgery, particularly? Shouldn't really. No, I mean, I didn't really get bogged down in astigmatism. Uh, that's primarily corneal. Um, it means that the uh, the corneal the corneal is rugby ball shaped. Um, if it's high astigmatism, um, you can put an astigmatic toric lens in. Um, it, uh, as long as, yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought it would have any impact in, in terms of the, the, the pressure lowering effect should be just as good as a normal cataract operation. Um, it takes slightly longer to put an astigmatic lens inside the eye, but I don't think it would have a great impact on the, on, on the NTG. Brilliant. Um, somebody has said, I have advanced normal tension glaucoma. We've got a lot of people with normal tension in this evening. Yeah, yeah sure. Three, That's all right. Three months ago, had MIGS and cataract surgery to both, cataract okay. surgery to both eyes. Also had SLT, which failed. If the pressure remains high, can you safely go on to have a trabeculectomy? Obviously, uh, individual, but as a, yeah. as a principle, can you have MIGS, uh, cataract, SLT, and then TRAB? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can. It depends a little bit what the mix was. If it was an eye stent, you could. Okay. Um, because that goes into the trabecular meshwork. If you've fiddled around with the conjunctiva, put a preservlow in, then you really wouldn't want to do a trabecular meshwork on top. You'd have to do a tube operation. So it depends a bit on what the mix was, which I can't really answer. But yeah, so that's a very specific question on, on what what the what the mix is dependent on the mix absolutely um somebody has had a or kind of had a trabeculectomy 18 months ago vision in that eye is now slightly blurred have been told they've got cataract is that likely to be the cause of of the blurring and, and can the cataract be treated so i'm assuming i i would think there's a very high chance that that is some cataract formation we know trabeculectomy accelerates cataract surgery and um uh, the surgery itself, the use of steroids after the trabeculectomy speeds up cataract formation. And, um, you know, we know that probably 30 to 40% of patients will need cataract surgery within the first couple of years after trabeculectomy. So likely to be uh, a cataract causing that problem. There's a very good question, or I think it's a very good question. You may disagree <laughs> that's just come in saying if a trabeculectomy can cause a cataract and cataract extract cataract extract extraction oh, can cause a trabeculectomy to fail, does this not making do the two 
operations together a sense of option uh-huh. it used it's, to be done but doesn't seem so popular now is what they've said yeah it used to be done um you might think so the problem is it doesn't work very well uh it works well from the cataract surgery but the trabeculectomies um they can work but they're less likely to work in the longer term um you might get away with it but we we used to do it and some patients could get away with it if they were very low risk patients usually older folk with mild disease um but um the problem is that the cataract surgery seems to cause inflammation which makes the trabeculectomy fail so if you do them together it doesn't work so That's very few, like a very I, good reason not to be doing i mean i used to do them but very few surgeons would do them now probably you know it's, it's gone out of fashion really brilliant thank you um a question saying, do steroids increase pressure? Drops after cataract surgery contain steroids, I understand. Uh, good question. Uh, the answer is yes, they, they do. Um, it's a genetically predispositioned uh, kind of um, predisposition. Most patients, it doesn't. Um, but there are some patients who are very strong steroid responders, it's likely to be genetic, um, maybe five. 10% of the population. Um, and if you give them steroid drops um, post-surgery, they can get quite high pressure rises. So it's hard to predict. It tends to go down a little bit with age. So if you're, for some reason, having cataract surgery in your 30s and 40s, some people have accelerated cataract, might be more likely to get a pressure problem than if you're having it in your 60s to 70s and 80s. The answer is yes, and it's genetically predetermined predisposed or predetermined so it's not going to be an issue generally blanket it, it may be I mean, for individuals uh, no i if you the, considering how much cataract surgery we do it's fairly uncommon to see a, a significant pressure rise as i'd say maybe five percent ten percent max so the vast majority of patients won't get a significant pressure rise but it can happen Fabulous. Thank you. Um, we've had a question that said, I've had cataract surgery on both eyes and have glaucoma in both eyes. Uh, so the cataracts have been removed. My mm. night vision is rubbish. Is this likely to be due to the glaucoma? Uh, yes. I mean, the cataract's gone. Um, glaucoma affects the field of vision. By night term vision, I suspect that if you, you're talking perhaps adapting to the dark. So if we go from a bright room to dimly lit, dimly lit room like a cinema, patients that that relies on your field of vision. And that is preferentially damaged in glaucoma. So the answer is that's likely to be glaucoma related. It's called dark adaptation. And it uh, it is a uh, it's it's um certainly a glaucoma symptom. Fabulous. Uh, just to clarify, there are a couple of questions that are talking about does glaucoma increase risk, uh, cataract surgery risks? I think we were kind of saying with the techniques and the equipment yeah. that we use now, not not particularly. I, I would agree. Um, somebody was just saying they've had swelling and immediate, immediate lens dislocation after cataract surgery. Is that is that common? Um, there are rare technical side effects um i mean if it was a, a an eye that's never had any other surgery it, it, it is rare but it can happen i mean the support of the lens can, be, can become weak with age or trauma or other conditions and sometimes the lens can fall in the back of the eye during cataract surgery so these are rare but recognized surgical complications really with cataract surgery i would imagine Fabulous. Uh, another one with a term that may need a little bit of an ex- explanation. Can you talk about the effect of high diplopia? Is that, have I said that right? Yeah, and then that's double vision. Um, the short answer is no, because okay. that's a, a double vision squint problem. Okay. But um, cataract surgery is unlikely to have much effect on it because you're, 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 you're changing the optics of the eye, but not the, the, the kind of eye muscle balance or movement. So that's... Uh, in the remit of, of a squint surgeon discussion fabulous uh oh that one's not 
desperately related to cataract. I don't know if you know the answer. I've had Presaflow surgery in my right eye. Can you advise if contact lenses can be worn? Uh, I think that's a, I would ask your, your surgeon. Um, depends a bit on the contact lens. Um, I wouldn't want it to be used too soon in the post-operative period. But if it's, you know, many months down the line, I think you probably could use soft contact lenses, you know, perhaps for social use. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem. Your surgeon may say something different. We don't really know. And there isn't a sort of guidebook for that. But that would be my own view that theoretically, yes. Fabulous. Um, I think we've covered this one, but somebody said I've got Presif I've had Presaflow surgery and have a bleb in each eye. Will future future cataract surgery affect the blebs? I think the answer was possibly. Possibly, was I agree. So yes. Was, uh, fabulous. Um, I have cataract glaucoma and an occlusion in the macular area. What problems with cataracts? What would be the problems with cataract surgery having had a micro stent? So we touched on uh uh the kind of ongoing from migs haven't you is there anything yeah. extra to add on that no i don't think so uh do, 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 do. if you have existing damage to optic nerves because of optic neuritis would cataract surgery be a problem well i think our, our attendees are, are are with all due respect and there's two questions in that Technically, no, in terms of it'll be just as easy to do the cataract operation, but the visual outcome might be impaired because the nerve's not working. So there are fundamentally two different issues. One is how easy is it for me as a surgeon to do the cataract surgery? It would make no difference to me. But whether you would see as well as a normal eye, I can't answer that question. It depends on how well that nerve's working. So, so those are the, the two entirely different questions. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, but clearly, if the nerve isn't working or there's optic nerve damage, you may be disappointed after cataract surgery. You may not, you may be delighted, but that's the key question that you need to ask your consultant. We've had somebody who's had um, a barbell implant surgery done quite young. Um, they're waiting for cataract surgery after the, the barbell surgery. Um, they've said once the cataract surgery is done, is it possible that that needs to be repeated in the future or, is, or will the artificial lens kind of last forever once it's done? Is it done? It's a good question. I mean, with modern artificial lenses, they they last for decades and decades. So the answer is you wouldn't anticipate and you'd expect it to last forever. Very rare. The lens can go cloudy. It's pretty uncommon with modern lenses. So, you know, this would be a, and the cataract won't grow back. So, you, you know, you don't repeat the surgery. Um, and, and with modern lenses, with in modern intraocular lenses, they remain clear for probably hundreds of years, I'd imagine. Fabulous. I have just launched the last poll. We have one minute left and I was just going to squeeze the last question in that we're going to be able to cover tonight, which was, are there different types of cataracts? Is a cataract a cataract a cataract? Um, or... Well, there are. There, I mean, there's congenital and there's traumatic um, and there's some fancy words for sort of super hyper advanced. So the answer is yes, there are. But for most people, you know, a cataract is more or less the same sort of thing. As long as it's you've not had a you know dart put through your eye or some awful trauma or a congenital, you know, you had a cataract aged three months or whatever. So the answer is yes, there are, which are a minutia of vast number of different types of cataract but for most people more or less the same sort of thing that's wonderful thank you i am aware that we haven't answered every single one of the questions i had popped a couple of um comments onto a couple saying um it, it, you know not not necessarily cataract specific so please right. do uh contact our helpline if we didn't get round to answering your question i'm ever so sorry um but please do contact our helpline they will be able to help you the contact details for the helpline are 01233 
648170 is the phone number and the email address is helpline at glaucoma.uk. They are available Monday to Friday, 9.30am to 5pm. They will be able to uh, help you out with any of your questions. Our next digital glaucoma support group is on Tuesday, the 13th of February between seven and eight. And we're looking at glaucoma jargon busting. All these terms that you may have heard, but are not exactly sure what they're all meaning. Um, Helen Doe, our helpline manager, is joining us to talk all things glaucoma language. So uh, please do join us. We would love to see you there. Um, and I would just like to say a huge, huge thank you to uh, Mr. Mark Westcott for your time this evening and for sharing all of that information about glaucoma and cataracts. It's really, really appreciated. And um, I hope everybody else has a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you all soon. If you get a moment to fit, fill in the survey monkey that will come to you after this session in an email, please, please do. We do read every single bit of feedback and uh, use it to improve our sessions. So thank you ever so much. And I look forward to catching up with some of you soon. Take care. Bye bye.